Welcome to The Authority File. I'm Bill Mickey, your host and the editorial director at Choice. During the next four episodes, we'll be talking with Susan Mizraki, editor of a new book published by Springer Nature called Libraries and Archives in the Digital Age. Susan is a William Aerosmith professor in the humanities at Boston University. She's also director of BU's Center for the Humanities and a professor of English. This series is brought to you by Springer Nature. Susan's book is a uniquely collaborative volume. It brings together contributions from librarians, library directors, and academic scholars that explore the impact the digital era has had on the collection and maintenance of scholarly and communal output in four distinct areas, access, preservation, archival politics, and the profession. While the book provides a wealth of information on the opportunities and challenges digital technology presents for scholarly and archival content, it also shines a bright light on the areas of occupational overlap among academics, librarians, and digital professionals, revealing how important, productive, and rewarding collaboration within an institutional structure can be. In this first episode, Susan and I talk about her professional background and the inspiration for her book. All right, so Susan, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Excellent. So why don't we start by just having you tell us a little bit about yourself and and your work and your research. Okay. Well, my uh, field is American literature, and uh, I uh, have basically been working my way forward in time uh, over the course of my career. So I began in the uh, 19th century, early 19th century, and um, with each book, I've sort of you know, move forward a bit. Um, my my work is all has also always been interdisciplinary. Uh, I I was a I majored both in English and in history uh, as an undergraduate, and I had a hard time you know trying to decide which of those fields I was I was going to you know pursue as a, as a vocation. I also did creative writing, and uh, that was pretty easy to to. Uh, decide against because I, I wanted to eat. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, and, and I, and I, I like scholarship. I, you know, I always like scholarship. So, but, right. but um, I, I have sort of kept my foot in the world of cultural history and uh, literature, um, literary history, um, you know, for, for most of my career. And uh, my second book uh, was on literature. My first book, which, which grew out of my dissertation was on, literature and historiography and representations of, of history, both in, in, you know, uh, works by, uh, historians, American historians of the 19th century, and also, um, by right literary writers. And, uh, my second book was, um, on literature and so, and social sciences. And, um, and it came to focus in particular on theological questions, um, that, uh, you know, I, I discovered were, were of great importance, both to, literary writers and, and to, um, social scientists. And, um, and my third, my, my, uh, next projects, book projects were on literature and economy. So, uh, you know, I, and, and with each, with each, uh, book, I sort of moved forward a bit more. Um, most recently, uh, I turned to biography and I, I wrote a biography of Marlon Brando, which was, uh, which got me into the 1950s. Yep. And actually, before, uh, because his his prehistory, his you know family history was quite interesting. And in turn of the century, Nebraska, uh, you know, and his engagement with Indians there. And but but uh, uh, I had always wanted to do a biography, and I, I assumed that my biography, my first biography, would be on Henry James, who has always been my favorite writer. But um, you know, this this Brando project kind of fell into my lap, and, and it was a labor of love. And, um, I actually have most recently, um, I just finished a little book about Henry James, um, for Oxford university press. It's called, you know, they, they have, uh, these very short introductions and I wrote a very short introduction to Henry James, which was very, very satisfying to sort of pack my, you know, lifelong love of this writer, Mm -hmm. you know, into a, a small form, you know, for the general public. So, um, and I w- would say too that I have been writing increasingly for a larger um, audience. You know, I've been aiming toward um, you know speaking, you know, beyond my field and right. even even um, to some extent beyond 
the humanities, you know, to, to people in other fields, in, in different fields. Yep. Which, which brings us to, to the present. <laughs> so, you know, you know, so you came to edit a book about libraries in the, in the digital age, but um, before we get into that, tell us a little bit about your interest in libraries in particular, starting perhaps with your work as a board member for the uh, Boston Public Library's anti-slavery collection. Well, the, the, um, the BPL, the Boston Public Library, has just been acquiring uh, new archives at, at an astonishing rate, mm-hmm. um, you know, in recent years. And, um, you know, it's their, it's their big archival turn. And, and they've, they've, always ha- they've always been very, um, you know, quick to the draw with, with um, acquisitions. But, but I think um, now it's, it's, it's really accelerated. And this new collection, it has about 16,000 items and it's, it's foundation um, is the papers of, of William Lloyd Garrison. And these are from the 1830s to the 1870s. So this was in a way the heart of my early work. I mean, this pure time period. And I just, you know, it, it's such a great subject, um, anti-slavery writings and, and, and actually the, the, re, the um, invitation to be on the board followed um, the forum that this libraries and archives book grew out of. I mean, the, the, the number of collaborations, you know, that, that came from that forum um, really were, you know, astonishing. And, mm-hmm. and so, I, you know, I got to know a number of people at the Boston Public Library and uh, Tom Blake uh, in particular uh, and, and uh, David Leonard, who's, who's head of the library. And um, Tom works in, in archives and was overseeing the anti-slavery collection. And, um, you know, we found that we spoke a common language. Um, about uh, collecting and restoring and keeping and digitizing and and right. uh, you know so this was just in some ways it's just a, a product of that original collaboration. Mm-hmm. So the the, the book um, libraries and archives in the digital age um, more or less sprang out of a forum, which I think you, you just mentioned. And can you, t- can you talk about the inspiration for, for this volume and, and the for- forum from which it originated? Well, I mean, I don't know how far back you want me to go, but, you know, I would say, um, I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I was going to mention, and it's, it's, it's really true that, um, you know, I've really been engaged with questions about libraries and archives and um, reading Mm-hmm. You know, reading that authors do um, for my whole career. Um, you know, my first book, in my first book, I wrote about the libraries of Melville. Actually, Melville's mm-hmm. library burned down. But before it did, um, you know, there were records of, of the books he had, uh, incredible, you know, works of theology, and, you know, which figured significantly both in my first and my second books. And Henry James also was a, was a voluminous reader and, um, and had um, quite, a lot of books. And, um, and then, you know, in the book um, on literature and the social sciences that I mentioned, it was, it was called the science of sacrifice. I mean, I, um, I was looking at the theology reading of major social scientists and also literary writers. And, um, and my Brando, the heart of the Brando book really was the over thousand, 4,000 book uh, library that Brando himself had. Um, and so, Every every scholarly scholarly work I've done has been focused on the reading of my sub subject and also the um, you know and and I've been always been very interested in marginalia but also in libraries the idea of building a library and I, I grew up in an academic family and I was very fortunate that um, you know everyone around me just loved books and they had and they and they. They, they had books. My father had books from his graduate school days. You know, my mother had poetry, you know, and my gra- grandfather had these old Yiddish books. And so I just had a sense of their preciousness. I was also taken a lot to, you know, public libraries as a kid. And, and so my, you know, best memories are just sitting in this, in the aisles, you know, in, in right. libraries looking through books. So, which, which I continued to do as a scholar. So, um, you know, there, there's a there's a kind of a lifelong um, way. There's a way in which I've been sort of steeped in libraries my whole life. I, I also would just add that um, this was kind of um, refreshed or given a jump start. You know, this interest in libraries and archives when my my son was a became a history major um, 
history and Latin American studies at, at Harvard. And he wrote a um, senior thesis. It was actually a prize winning senior thesis on the bowl of our archive. So that got me interested again at some of the uh, in some of the new literature that was coming out on archives. And, you know, the, the last couple of decades, I mean, I think Derrida's essay on the archive, um, there really has been a kind of outpouring of theoretical interest on the part of people in literature, cultural studies, history, anthropology, and um, the richness of the debates in the field are, are really stunning. So um, it was a very exciting area. And, um, you know, when I, this, the, the forum itself grew out of uh, the fact that I became an administrator for the first time at BU. Um, mm-hmm. I, I took on an administrative post as director of BU's Center for the Humanities. And, um, you know, when I started that job, I realized it gave me leverage to pursue projects that, you know, had long interested me, but that seemed to me of special um, public importance, you know, at this moment. And, you know, it, they're really, I mean, you know, there's, there's so many ways in which libraries, you know, have become, you know, prominent in our cultural landscape now. And, I, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with digitization and, yeah. and, um, and all the innovation, you know, surrounding uh, collections. And um, so, you know, one of the, I, I, I thought the library forum was the way to begin my directorship. And, my first month as director, I reached out to Robert Hudson, who was um, head of BU's library, and I asked him if he wanted to join me in organizing a forum on libraries. And he was like, you know, <laughs> wow, <laughs> what a great idea. You know, he, right. he you know, I just, um, it was just, it led to um, just a wealth of, of opportunities. Um, you know, when I reached out to him, he said, he told me that, you know, he had been running BU's library for decades. I mean, I knew that. I I, I knew him from. I I actually have been at BU for a ridiculously long time, about thirty three, <laughs> thirty three years, and and so I I knew of uh, uh, Bob, and I, you know, was aware of him. We might have had a few exchanges here and there, but you know, we'd never had a conversation. You know, mm-hmm. I'd never heard about his work as a medieval historian. You know, et cetera. And anyway, um, he told me that this was the first time in his now, he might have been exaggerating, but he, he told me it was the first time a BU faculty member had ever um, asked him to collaborate on a joint event like this. And yeah. um, it was ridiculous because, you know, the guy, I mean, first of all, he had amazing contacts. He put, he immediately put me in touch with David Ferreo, um, who was head of the National Archives of the United States. I mean, he was appointed by Barack Obama. I mean, this is mm. a major, major person. And yeah. Ferreo was an old friend of Bob Hudson's, and he agreed to be on our panel, um, be one of our panels setting directions for libraries and archives in the digital age. I mean, the reason he couldn't contribute to the book is because um, he wasn't really allowed to because of the government, you know, connection. But right. um, but he was a wonderful, you know, participant, you know, at the forum on this panel, and it was just very exciting, you know, to hear his perspective on on the issues um, we were addressing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So yeah, I you know it, it's it's such a pleasant kind of byproduct that that the forum kind of connected you with you know librarians at BU around Boston and 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 beyond and and the surprise really that there hadn't already been relationships between faculty and libraries at that level before. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about that. You know why that might be, or um, and then what kind of conversations you might have had about that at the time? Well, I mean, I'll just say that, you know, it's, I mean, one of the things about BU as an institution is that it's, it's, it's set smack in the center of the city Mm -hmm. and it's less than a mile from the Boston public library. And then in the other, that's the, uh, my, my geography is not always so good. I think that's the Eastern direction. Um, It's, it's a, less than a mile from the Boston Athenaeum, you know, to the, to the South and, or maybe the North. Um, but it is, um, you know, it's wonderfully centrally located and, you know, students who are in the know, I mean, undergraduates, graduate students, you know, use the Boston public library all the time, but faculty, you know, um, people at BU were, you know, have never been in the habit of, reaching out. And, um, you know, I had the same experience with David Leonard, you know, head of the Boston Public Library as I did with 
you know, Bob Hudson. I mean, yeah. he said to me, um, you know, he had been kind of hankering for some kind of collaboration with an academic institution in Boston, you know, since he had arrived. And, <laughs> um, and again, he was just very excited um, to co-sponsor our forum. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, he immediately saw all of the sort of opportunities for them and for us, you know, um, that, that could be enabled by the bridge. And it's true. I mean, we've had now student internships that followed. We've had other joint events. Um, Mm -hmm. But the same thing happened with the Boston Athenaeum. Um, They put me in touch with Hannah Weissman, who is their uh, director of education. She's just been an an absolutely wonderful collaborator now for years, um, Mm -hmm. result of this original outreach. And, you know, it's, it's like dominoes. I mean, one Um, collaboration leads to another. And, you know, Hannah Weissman is um, understandably very well connected in the Boston area. And she got us connected to the Massachusetts Historical Society and the Peabody Essex Museum. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's as as if, um, you know, the, the, that original forum has continued to bear fruit in the way of sort of bridges across academic institutions and, and libraries across the city and, and the country, even the world. But, but what, I guess what I would say is I, I think that, I don't know if I I think people, first of all, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, I was actually, you know, maybe we might want to keep that, say that for later, this question of why people don't reach out or why we, uh, you know, I, I mean, I think it's an interesting issue mm-hmm. right now, especially because there's a lot of discussion about the public humanities and the public, the need for academics to be uh, better, you know, bridge builders, you know, with the larger community, right. nation, globe. And so there is a lot of attention being paid. But but I do think still um, institutionally, it's it's a challenge, you know, yep. for a lot of people. So yeah, we can we can uh, pin that for for a little bit later. And so just going back to the book um, specifically, I mean, you've mentioned you're you're particularly proud of the diversity of contributors um, to it, um, whether it's across professional roles, ethnicities, and, and and subject matter. And I'm wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, this is only the second book that I've edited before because I've always heard from from people that um, people in the field that, that editing books is, is, is a nightmare project. Um, <laughs> this one actually was a dream. The contributors were just, they were so professional and so well-behaved and getting their work in on time and responding well to my editing and, you know, et cetera. So, uh, but I, my pre the, the one book I had edited before was, was called religion and cultural studies. It was published by Princeton university press in 2001. And it, um, it was a kind of follow-up from my book on, on sacrifice, ritual sacrifice. And one of the things I did for that book was I decided I'm just going to find what I consider to be the most, some of the most exciting work going on mm-hmm. in this area and, you know, just kind of follow my instincts. And, um, and that will inevitably lead to a, a kind of a, a mixed um, you know, group of contributors. And right. the, the other thing, you know, I, I mean, I did think a lot about, you know, because uh, I was thinking of a, of a forum that, that was a bridge building exercise. I, I was thinking about um, people from different professional um, areas. I mean, it was very important for me, you know, for example, you know, to make sure that we had you know, that we were operating, you know, with a, with a print under a principle of professional inclusivity. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to make sure that we had librarians of, of various, you know, kinds represented because they're, you know, they're academic librarians, they're, they're librarians who, I mean, we had um, Jean- Jeanette Bastian, who's another person Bob Hudson put me in touch with, who teaches library science at uh, Simmons College, and she's a leading um, expert on community archives. And, mm-hmm. um, and then we had, um, Alberto Mangel, who was, um, head of the National Library of Argentina, um, when he came to speak at our forum and also has written a lot of really wonderful theoretical books on libraries. But I, I wanted to make sure that we had people from, who represented different professional capacities and areas, you know, in addition to scholars and, 
um, and academics. And but but I do think that the the principle or, or the idea of looking for exciting work and you know BU was just um, kind of natural to. I mean, it was it, it really astonished me to learn about what was going on at, at BU. I mean, Falu Ingam's work. Um, on African languages, um, and you know this this massive digital project um, that um, I mean I knew Falu um, as you know someone in linguistics and anthropology, um, you know from BU humanities circles, but I never really um, explored you know his work, um, right. and it was you know a revelation. So I guess what I would say is that. It it was all. It seemed to me almost inevitable that once you know I was I was looking for for excellent for great work. The the um, the group of scholars just sort of fell together, and mm-hmm. um, they come. You know, really, it's it is the case that our contributors come from all over the world, um, right? U.S., South America, and um, and also uh, you know their research covers um, territories you know from all over to you know indigenous America, Africa, Asia, you know in Europe. So um, you know it was a it was a very exciting process. You just heard from Susan Mizrucki, who edited Libraries and Archives in the Digital Age, published by Springer Nature. Susan is a William Aerosmith professor in the humanities at Boston University. She's also director of BU Center for the Humanities and a professor of English. This series is brought to you by Springer Nature. Join us next week when we continue our conversation and talk about the working relationships between librarians, researchers, and faculty. And one of my favorite um, conversations at our forum was between um, David Wexler um, was uh, is head of a this incredible state of the art archive in Hollywood called um, Hollywood Vaults. It's in, it's in Los Angeles, um, and uh, it's it's a commercial archive that I worked at when I was doing the Brando book because Brando's estate keeps all of his papers there. And um, Wexler is, just has all of these amazing contacts um, across the country and the world, you know, for storage um, because you know he stores um, the materials, you know, of some of the most famous people in the world. And um, at one point, you know, he was talking to Dave, uh, to Tom Blake of the Boston Public Library about helping the BPL with some of their storage needs, you know, because he had a site, I think, someplace in the Midwest where they had some space. If you like what you hear, rate us or give us a review on your podcast platform of choice. As always, sponsorship and advertising for the Authority File podcast are handled by Choices Advertising Manager Pam Marino. And all of our episodes are produced by Choices Senior Digital Media Producer Mark Dirks and Digital Media Assistant Sabrina Kofer. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us.